we've seen much um, needed attention over the past few years to ensuring that when medicines are developed, they're developed um, reflective of the unique data that comes from different ethnic, racial, uh, gender-based communities. Hello and welcome to another episode in the Transatlantic Biotech series with Cranmore Executive Search. This interview series has been put together with the vision of tapping into the strong connections that exist in the biotech communities between Ireland and the US. My name is Sean Carter. I'm the co-founder and managing partner at Cranmore Executive Search. Our guest today is Maureen Bennett, life science leader and partner at Jones Day. Maureen is a Boston-based healthcare life science lawyer and an and an industry recognized leader in legal, regulatory, and ethical issues associated with clinical research. A long study LGBTQ activist and an Irish language enthusiast, Maureen Gora Mela Mayoli, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and I suppose, um, you know, where do we start? Um, I, I know I've had the pleasure of, um, of, of having uh, many quite interesting conversations with you over the last few weeks, Maureen. And, um, you know, where I'd like to jump in is, uh, I suppose you're a really interesting story and uh, I suppose to be a little bit biased, um, your connection to my part of the world in North Belfast. So can, can you tell me uh, a little bit about your family's journey, please? I sure will. And, and thank you again, Sean, for having me. It's a real pleasure to be with you. Um, yes, I'm a, a proud uh, daughter or granddaughter of Belfast. Uh, my grandparents uh, were married in 1909 in the Holy Cross of Ardoin. Uh, I think in your neighborhood, uh, yeah. and it, it's a really uh, interesting connection to where I find myself professionally and personally now in terms of interest. Uh, they were they met as medical professionals. Uh, my grandfather a doctor, my grandmother a nurse at what was then known as the Jervis Street Hospital in Dublin, and coming from different religious traditions, um, which is not news to the island, uh, they. <laughs> They got married in Belfast, uh, away from the families, and then off to New York on the boat, uh, straight away after that. Isn't 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 that amazing? Just how far we've moved on. I suppose where you know back back in those days, you know, uh, uh, coming from um, you know two different religions, they they felt that they needed to make that move. I suppose to the U.S. to uh, to, to live their lives. Yes, and you know, like so many other things, uh, as you one gets older. One appreciates um, and wishes that there was more time to spend with grandparents. I never knew my grandfather. He died very young, uh, taking care of a patient in Connecticut. My grandmother passed away when I was also very young. But uh, I would just imagine the stories they would tell would be not simple, but probably as a very complex set of reasons which uh, drove them to come to the U.S. Yeah. And so over time, um, I've, as you mentioned, studied the Irish language. I took classes in Irish history when I was at university. And just as a matter of personal interest, being in the life sciences field, I've been so delighted to see the development of young country, uh, young companies, as well as the welcoming nature of the uh, Northern Ireland um, Irish uh, uh, business community for inbound investment in the life sciences. So it's just such a wonderfully rich uh, ecosystem and and culture, uh, including cultural ecosystem. Of course, yeah. And then the your, your professional journey, I, I suppose, um, Mari, um, you know, as a as a legal professional, professional um, an attorney, um, you know, your your journey started. The start of your journey wasn't in life science, is that right? Uh, that's right. In fact, when I was in law school, I don't believe life sciences was really um, a, a legal discipline offered yeah. anywhere. So it wasn't my intention to get involved. I actually had the good fortune to get involved indirectly because of some other work I was doing. Um, I had the opportunity to be involved early on in some of the uh, in environmental law practice uh, at my law firm. And with that experience, a lot of the companies that were um, involved in chemical related work, I, I worked a lot of toxic waste cleanups and the like, and uh, a number of companies that uh, started developing life sciences divisions to go along with their industrial chemical divisions. And so um, I just thought it might be an interesting step to try and cross over and learn more about FDA law 
and some of the things that were happening in this burgeoning life sciences field. But for me, really, this hurting point came around the year 2000 uh, when I had the chance to work with a company that was at that time uh, launching its first global phase three uh, clinical trial for a rare disease. And that provided me the chance to really get immersed in the legal, ethical, commercial, uh, practical issues associated with clinical trials. And I had a great mentor at the time who really is responsible for teaching me a lot of what I, I knew. And it was at that point that I decided that's really where I wanted to spend my legal careers. A point that I, I remind a lot of young law students uh, and young lawyers with whom I work that uh, I was 15 years in before I really figured out what I wanted to do with my with my career. So um, it's always worth keeping one's eyes open to things that, that strike an interest. Right. And I suppose uh, industrial waste was uh, was biotech and farmers uh, gain. <laughs> Um, and I, I, you know, you you have shared with me previously, you know, the the the, the quite interesting, uh, um, so with bit of information that you found about your found out about your grandfather, um, in that he was he was involved in in conducting clinical research quite early uh, in his career. Yes, you know, I have um, uh, a very close cousin who has spent a number of years really digging into our family history for us and. My grandfather was um, uh, a bacterial bacteriologist as well as having his own private practice. But I do remember my father and his siblings talking about sort of what a mad scientist he was. He would work on all sorts of things in the basement, including you know putting together airplanes and 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 working on uh, different uh, subjects. Uh, but at one point, we ran across an article that ran in the local newspaper around the turn of the 20th century that just happened to mention that he was involved in some early clinical research um, in the profession. And it really was a jolt for me because um, it, it just felt like an immediate through line between what he might have been involved in uh, and also uh, what, what I'm doing now. So a really cool fact, I thought. Yeah, it's, it's always it's always so uh, so satisfying, I suppose, um, when you're able to connect dots to, to the past. And uh, what do you think your grandparents would think about your involvement in clinical trials and clinical research now? Well, you know, I th I think um, it, it's sort of hard to project what um, a per person who died almost a hundred years ago, in the case of my grandfather, and about sixty years ago, in the case of my grandmother, might. Think I, I've always heard about how curious they were um, about science and the medical profession. So I would imagine their first question would be, "What's going on in the industry?" And you know what what wonderful discoveries are uh, on the verge of, of coming to pass. But um, I'd like to think that they would be pleased to think that um, I was participating in some way um, in a profession that helped bring um, medicines uh, to patients. Brilliant, excellent. And I, I, I suppose one of the kind of buzzwords that is uh, thrown around quite now, uh, quite a bit now, is um, uh, DCTs and and uh, decentralized clinical trials. Maureen, um, you know, it is amusing to sit down with a with a legal expert, you know, someone that's the, at the uh, the focus of um, you know the regulatory, contractual, and and ethical um, uh, issues that affect clinical trials and clinical research. And DCTs represent a revolutionary shift in the traditional model of conducting clinical research. How do DCTs um, introduce unique regulatory challenges, Maureen, and considering the, the shift from traditional site-based models, um, from your experience, what measures are regulatory bodies taking to adapt uh, to address these uh, changes? And what developments do you envisage happening in the next, next couple of years? Sure. Well, you know, the path to decentralized clinical trials has actually been happening over the course of the last decade or so, but it really got a jump start during COVID when it just became uh, very challenging to have clinical trial participants come to the typical brick and mortar study sites because of some of the risks associated with COVID. But uh, as I mentioned, it was really something that had been happening for some while in, in great part, um, uh, 
supported by the great technological developments that were coming about in terms of how patients could be recruited, the use of wearable device to monitor developments, um, the uh, FDA's previous acceptance of electronic informed consent procedures. So, um, but during COVID, it really um, put the uh, impetus on the industry and also the FDA in the U.S., as well as other regulatory, similar regulatory bodies around the world to not just kind of observe these changes, but to actually um, put some guardrails around them. And so um, that's something that uh, has also allowed decentralized trials to continue even after you know the, the uh, height of the COVID crisis has passed. So some of the differences in terms of regulatory orientation are at a really fundamental level in the U.S., one practicing clinical trials related law would by and large be practicing FDA law for the most part. Um, now with the introduction of decentralized trials, in addition to the federal law, there are a number of state laws that need to be considered. So for example, uh, telehealth is now being used increasingly as a way to help connect principal investigators to clinical trial participants. And so one has to consider the different telehealth uh, laws. Uh, similarly, we're seeing in, in sort of an interesting um, throwback to an older era when the doctor's house call was made, we're seeing the utilization of remote personnel coming to a clinical trial participant's home, perhaps to supervise the administration of the drug or to help with follow-up. And so state uh, licensure procedures as it pertains to those remote professionals also comes into play. And also, um, some of the challenges include uh, ensuring that the things that used to be done all under one roof, whether perfect, perfectly done or imperfectly done, were still kind of contained. And now there's an even greater challenge for the sponsors and the investigators to really oversee an enterprise that may take place across a number of different states using highly uh, complex um, a data management, data collection tools. So there are a lot of um, developments uh, that involve other kinds of laws. And then I, I would just also add that for, even from the FDA perspective, uh, they recently uh, issued guidance um, in 2023 in draft form. And some of what uh, the agency has been looking for is increase attention to the validation of digital tools, for example. And so there are a, a lot of new technical standards that are being put into writing that uh, the clinical trial uh, drivers have to think about. So so how, how did uh, DCTs uh, impact legal considerations when you're working um, cross-border? Maureen, I know you've got a wealth of international experience. Um, can, can you give some advice on, on, on um, the implications of that? that may be considered there. Sure. Well, one of the, the good um, uh, developments uh, in terms of thinking about implementing DCTs across jurisdiction is that there's already been a tremendous amount of thinking and, and uh, efforts towards harmonization of clinical trial rules um, uh, across the globe. Now, that's not to say that the rules are the same in every place, but we do have bodies like the International Conference on Harmonization um, that has uh, offered um, uh, tools for uh, participants uh, in clinical trials uh, and has regularized some of the good clinical practice standards. So that's something that um, the industry has already dealt with to some extent. That said, um, one of the things that a sponsor will always need to look at if they're thinking about um, uh, uh, implementing a protocol across multiple jurisdictions will be, again, some of these challenges with um, what laws will apply to a DCT. So if it, it's one thing to have a clinical trial site in New York and then have a participant in New Jersey and dealing with a telehealth law um, between states um, or personnel going to site go, going to visit a participant across a state line, 
it's quite another if there is a patient in France um, going to a clinical trust site, but then goes home to Belgium. That might be that that implicates national laws. Also, I think in many jurisdictions outside the U.S., one would find that the data privacy environment um, is much more stringent. There's more of a tendency for the um, GDPR for GDPR like laws to be in place, and so you know that can also mean that there's even more sensitivity around the um, uh, protection of data that might be collected in more unconventional uh, means, and including from someone's home. And Chris, so, so. Um, uh, we, we've seen um, a lot of like science biotech companies make, uh, make a transatlantic move and set up shop in the US recently um, with uh, with varying degrees of success. Maureen, um, short of Short of oncology, of course, is the is in the news uh, as a huge success story recently. Um, however, navigating the complexities of establishing a presence in the U.S. requires careful planning and understanding of the regulatory, legal, and business landscape. Do you have any advice uh, on how organizations can successfully achieve this? Um, and from your experience, can you provide examples of positive and negative practice? Sure. Well, you know, the attraction to the U.S. market um, can be sort of uh, obvious in terms of the size of the of the commercial market, the opportunity to do B2B uh, connections, um, the access to capital is often viewed as being advantage, you know, present circumstances, maybe notwithstanding. Um, but it's still very important, I think, for a company to be really clear on its reasons for coming to the U.S. Um, and in that regard, some of the companies that we've seen do it best are those that have uh, really uh, crafted a plan um, to think of, and and with the kind of a timeline associated with it. One of the things we have over here is, um, particularly in, in some of the, the rich uh, life sciences ecosystems, is um, a, a lot of community support. Um, there are incubators, there are innovation centers that can provide companies with an opportunity to do an advanced look and spend some time here before you know necessarily forming a company and hiring a whole bunch of people. Now, of course, in some cases that, that you one has to strike where the iron's hot, and so there may be sort of an immediate jump to the market, but. Uh, I think having a really uh, disciplined plan is one of the things that uh, marks the success of most uh, companies that do well over here, uh, as well as in other markets. Um, the other thing that um, you know we we find important is uh, companies that establish a good balance between having local personnel and expertise supplied, and also having. Of some someone representing the founders, you know, people on the ground who really are immersed in the in the company. One um, misstep that we sometimes see is where most of the administration of a company remains offshore, but then there's an effort to hire people in the U.S. Uh, just as it would be the case in in any EU member state. Uh, the employment laws can be very tricky for those who have not had experience with them. Uh, for example, uh, because of the vagaries of our uh, healthcare system, health benefits is an extremely important pick part of the right. employment landscape. Um, so that's something to 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 have in mind. You know, having some local expertise balance with your uh, your company personnel. Another um, mistake we sometimes see is companies that are uh, come and establish a company without thinking through, for example, their international tax structure. Um, there's an, a tremendous amount of tax planning that will will go into the establishment of an offshore entity, you know, including thinking through where one's IP is, where the revenue streams and supply chain will be coming from, and so. Uh, we find that companies that do that in advance um, um, uh, really can set themselves up very nicely. Right, and and hopefully we'll see some more um, companies make that make that transition um, across the Atlantic in the coming years. I I know there is a, a massive push um, to spin out um, more biotechs from 
from the, the main universities in Dublin and uh, in in the north um, there is a um, a lot of uh, very um, um, uh, able and excited people pushing the north as a clinical research hub. Yes, like such as from Queens, um, you know, we're seeing a lot of co companies come out of there and uh, you know, sort of supportive infrastructures for that. Yeah, so there's there's a there's a there's there's a lot of um, really positive and exciting things happening in life science right across the island. Um, so um, yeah, we're we're uh, we'll keep an eye on things and hopefully there's and, and, new part of stories. And I'd also say that, you know, whether it be here in Boston or in, in, in other parts of the U.S., there's also a really well-established um, Irish, Irish-American business community that, yeah. you know, can also <clears throat> serve as another tool for uh, welcoming companies that, that come in and, and, and just want to share stories and insights on, on the best ways to succeed in the marketplace. Yeah, yeah, kids. Um, so... I, we we know that working in the biotech industry, Maureen, uh, particularly at, a, at an executive level, uh, can be a far cry from the relative stability and predictability of law, academia, or or even clinical work. I suppose. What advice would you give someone early or midway through their their career? We were speaking of pivoting into the chaos of a startup uh, or a biotech uh, industry. What advice would you give them? Yeah, well, <laughs> it's it, it's interesting. I think that. Um... You know, one person's chaos can be another person's, you know, positive adrenaline rush, and maybe it, it's it's a little it's a little of both. Those who might want to to join a biotech in an early stage, um, you have the opportunity to wear a number of different yeah. hats and to serve different roles, and so that can be a great learning opportunity um, as well. Uh, it's also an opportunity to learn some flexibility. What might be the game plan in January may have pivoted greatly by April. And some people enjoy that kind of unpredictability and some people do not. And so I think one lesson over, overall is to think about where you feel most comfortable as a professional. Sometimes it is in sort of the, you know, to the extent there is anything such as a safe uh, business environment these days, maybe there are safer ones. Um, but I think the other thing I notice is that if you are interested in putting your toe into the emerging biotech company space, we see a lot of companies have repeat players. So those folks work very closely together. And then often when it's time to start the next company, you'll see the gang get back together again. And so uh, I think that there's an opportunity for tremendous sort of loyalty um, to, to develop from those experiences. Yeah, they're, they're chaos junkies, I suppose. Yes, <laughs> perhaps so. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, we, we've been incredibly fortunate, Maureen, to, to feature three uh, remarkable female leaders as our uh, inaugural guests on the podcast series. Um, at our previous discussions, we've, we've explored the nuances of diversity and the hurdles associated with promoting inclusivity in fields traditionally dominated by men. However, the concept of diversity has evolved uh, quite a bit in recent times. Um, when you think about where the world is now as a more forward thinking and progressive place, uh, especially about issues um, uh, you're on, on diversity, inclusivity and equity, as someone with a a long-standing commitment to LGBTQ activism. How would you say pharma and biotech stays abreast of that? And and do you believe biotech pharma have done enough to improve diversity, equity, and inclusion? Well, thanks for the question, Sean. And I, I think that um, probably the answer is always things are better and things can be better. Um, and that's something that one has to really keep uh, an eye on. I think we've seen many more uh, women sitting at the top or near the top of, of companies, for example. And I don't think it's an accident that we, we often see that companies that are uh, run by women will also tend to have other women in the C-suite. Um, I think that there still can be a lot more done to, uh, to achieve diversity across all sorts of different lines. Um, that said, I think that as an industry, this is an industry that probably has done better than some others. 
And I think that some of that also has to do with the cross-pollination between life sciences and healthcare. And we've seen much um, needed attention over the past few years to um, ensuring that when medicines are developed, they're developed um, reflective of the unique data that comes from different ethnic, racial, uh, gender um, uh, based communities. And so um, I have been very pleased to see some of the developments that have come through, for example, uh, legislation here in the US that is, tr is now trying to really provide um, drug sponsors with more tools as to how to think about um, the, the, the ways that uh, recruitment and assessment of, of this data can, can take place to create uh, more in inclusive that results in health equity. Um, so I, I think that, that there is a lot that's being done in the industry. Um, I think, you know, as it pertains to the LGBTQ community, I think there's also been some, um, well needed attention to how recruitment, um, principles can be, um, handled in a sensitive way so that, um, uh, people feel, uh, like they're welcome to enter a clinical trial or to just seek health care more generally. But, you know, this is an issue that has also become um, quite politicized in different ways in this country. So um, it's it's a matter of just kind of keeping at it. Of course, Maureen, there's still a lot, lot of uh, lot of work to do, but with, uh, with people with the right, um, I suppose, energy and uh, the right outlook, I'm sure there will be, um, there, you know, be a lot more strides made in, in the coming years. Maureen, um, I, I really appreciate your your time today um and and as always um i always come away a little bit more uh, knowledgeable and um you know it's been a been a pleasure uh speaking with you and thank you very much for taking part in our in our podcast series it, it's my pleasure sean and i look forward to uh to to listening to your next lineup of guests um thank you for what you're doing to help advance the cause uh across the water you're welcome thank you okay slan fun.